everybody, Claire here from Van Isle Labradoodles, and we're here today with a two-week update for the Cafe Noir litter. Now, you'll probably remember from our previous videos with this litter, these are Australian multi-gen Labradoodles who are going to mature to a medium size. And the parents of this litter are Oshana and Ombre. And today, we're going to give you a bit of an update on what they've accomplished over this last week. There's been uh, quite a few milestones that they've reached, so we're going to discuss those. We're going to go through a, just a tiny little bit of handling the puppies and uh, show you some of the things that we've been doing with them. We'll give you an update on their weights, and we have one milestone that's a pretty exciting one we'll tell you about. And then we're going to talk about how to set your house up and get ready for your new puppy. So we have lots of fun things to talk about today. And one of the things you'll probably notice right off is Oshana's not with us today. She's comfortable enough that she's quite happy to leave the puppies for a brief period of time. So she often leaves them now for up to 45 minutes. So that makes her really happy because she can go and chase the ball more. And that is Oshana's favorite thing to do. The puppies are nursing more and for longer, so that's why they're able to be left for longer periods of time. So she's already starting the process of separating herself from them, just to a small degree, but getting them ready. So that's the first thing that's different. And the second thing you'll notice that's different today is the actual whelping box itself. You'll see that there are now pee pads on most of the surface of the box. And that's because one of the major milestones that these little Labradoodles have reached this past week is that they are starting to eliminate on their own. And this is also one of the signals that tells Oshana that it is okay to leave them alone for longer periods of time. Uh, for us, it means we have to do a bit more cleanup, so our job becomes a little bit more demanding. And for Oshana, it means she gets a little bit of break from always helping them to eliminate. So it's a very, very big day for the puppies when they start to eliminate on their own. And it's a, a significant milestone for them. And the other significant milestone this past week is that some of them have opened their eyes. And we have a couple of puppies who still have closed eyes, some whose eyes are fully open, and some who just have little slits and probably will have them fully open in the next 24, 48 hours. So we'll try and uh, get some shots of open eyes for you. Uh, they may all decide to keep them closed tight. Uh, they're sometimes not the most cooperative because we can't tell them, hey, open your eyes for the camera. But we'll do our best to, to show you some nice open eyes. And one thing you might not know is that puppies all are born with blue eyes, just like humans. And their eyes tend to stay that blue color, uh, blue color for at least the first 12, 16 weeks or so. So usually when you take your puppy home, you have a blue-eyed puppy. Uh, these puppies will all end up with dark brown eyes because they are chocolate puppies. So let's get started on weights and each of the puppies. The, so the first one we'll do is light blue collar. And you can see <laughs> Mr. Light Blue Collar is quite relaxed. This is what we call the Labradoodle pose upside down. Labradoodles just love to be upside down and they adore having tummy rubs. So Mr. Light Blue Collar is already firmly entrenched in that Labradoodle pattern. So I'm just going to disturb him from his nice nap here and pick him up ever so slowly. Hi, buddy. Now they still can't hear. And light blue does have his eyes open. So we'll see if he'll waken up enough to show us some of those nice blue eyes. So far, oh, they're just a little bit open right now. So I'm not sure if you'll be able to pick them up on the video, but he does have his eyes open. And Mr. Light Blue now weighs 788 grams. So he gained 243 grams this past week. So he's doing really well. So we'll put him back down. There we go. And the next one that we'll take a look at is this one right over here, who happens to be making his way right over to me. And this is Mr. Red Collar Boy. 
Now, Red Collar Boy also has his eyes open, and he does have them open right now. Hey, he's giving everybody a good look at the world and a good look inside his mouth. And Red Collar weighs 858 grams now, and he gained 228 grams over the past week. Hi, buddy. Now, one of the things uh, that you may have seen there on the camera, uh, and the reason why I've got Red Collar right now, is because the puppies can move. This is their other major milestone that they accomplished this week. They are up on all fours, and they are starting to motor around. It's a, a big change when they all start being able to move. So put Red down, and here we'll grab Mr. Dark Blue Collar Boy, the little party fellow. Whoopsie, there we go. Do you want to put your head over there? There we go. He's looking for a pillow there, Mr. Red. Now, Dark Blue Collar Boy does not have his eyes open yet, so he's not going to show us his eyes yet. I think that probably we're going to wait for about 48 hours. He can open his mouth very nicely, though, can't you? He gets you can. Um, but the eyes are just starting to show little, tiny, little bits of slits at the very inside. So they're going to probably be another 48 hours or, sh or so before they open up. And he weighs 686 grams, and he's gained 245 grams this past week. So he's really done well. Um, I have been helping him out a bit to uh, find the milk bar and get in there and, and get a little bit of extra milk because he's the smallest one at the moment. And you can see Red is moving back around again. He's probably on the hunt for Oshana. So we'll go over here to Mr. Green Collar Boy. Now you notice before I pick them up, I always give them a little stroke. And that's just so that they're aware that I'm here, that something's going to happen, and that we're not startling them. So here he is, Mr. Green Collar Boy. He's going to say hi to everybody. And Mr. Green Collar's eyes are also not opened. So he's not going to give you a, a look at those eyes yet. And his are still pretty seal shut. So I'd say he's going to be a good 48 hours as well. He seems to be very tired. He can hardly hold his head up. He's just going to be all relaxed. And Mr. Green Collar Boy right now weighs 942 grams. So he's almost at a kilogram already and he's gained 313 grams in the past week so he has no problem finding the milk bar and i think maybe it's because he's so relaxed and sleepy that uh, he's able to gain weight like that so we'll put green back down here i'll just put him down there next to mr dark blue and well, how about we try mr brown collar the other party boy here he's over here kind of by himself so he won't mind being picked up hi buddy hi and you'll notice again i'm talking to them and of course they can't hear a thing I say, but I'm still talking to them. Now Mr. Brown Collar just showed you a good shot of inside his mouth and his eyes are open as well. And I'm just trying to see if he's showing them to us a little bit. He's giving us a little tiny bit of a glimpse at his pretty, pretty little blue eyes. And Brown Collar weighs 732 grams and he's gained 223 grams over this past week. So he's doing really nicely too. The two parties are two of the smaller puppies in the litter. and In fact, I believe they are the two smallest, which is kind of coincidental. So we'll put him back here. And now I'll try Mr. Orange Collar Boy. Now, if you can see while I pick him up, Mr. Orange Collar is one of the ones that has all these beautiful ripples of color. And he is definitely a chocolate sable. He may, in fact, actually be a brindle. Um, there isn't a DNA test for Brindle, so I can't tell you definitively, but those lines and sort of stripes are indicative of a Brindle pattern, which is a beautiful thing. And now, Mr. Orange Collar, he is 1 kilogram, 1.05 kilograms. He's a bruiser, and he gained 405 grams this past week <laughs> that's amazing so uh, clearly he knows where the best place at the milk bar is that's really incredible that he ate that much <laughs> something and he has little slits for his eyes so they're not all together open i'm just going to get mr green collar he's getting a little concerned that he's away from everyone so we'll put him over here so he's next to the group so 
there we go mr mr orange collar back to him he does have slits already so his eyes will probably be fully open in the next 24 hours or so i'll put him back down there to keep mr green company hopefully and then we'll move on to miss peach collar one of our little ladies here hey sweetheart and miss peach collar is just doing great with her beautiful little goatee there and she is an extremely calm puppy she's very very chill and laid back and peach collar right now weighs 950 grams and she's gained 323 grams this past week and her eyes are not open yet either and she looks to me like she's going to be a 48 hour wait for her eyes so we'll put her back poor mr green he's just having quite the time there we'll put him a little closer to me see if that helps him out and now we'll go over here and we'll get this little semi upside down baby here this will be purple come on purple there we go and mr purple is all ready to say hello to us and purple's eyes are also still closed and again they're quite tightly sealed so i say he is also a 48 hour wait before his eyes open up and he also weighs 1.01 kilograms, so he's over the one kilogram mark already. And he gained 365 grams last week. So he's another big eater. And you can see he's also very calm, very quiet, very relaxed. Right now, the only one who's making any fuss is Green, because he didn't like getting disturbed from his nap, I guess. And way, 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 way over here, underneath the pig rail, whoopsie. This is Miss Pink Collar. See if we can get her to come out and make an appearance here. Hey, my little girl. There she comes. Now, Miss Pink Collar was the one who opened her eyes up first. She opened her eyes on Tuesday. So she is the leader of the pack in terms of eye opening. And she also looks like she's very tired. Everybody's very sleepy right now. And Pink Collar weighs 870 grams, and she gained 292 grams over the past week. Now, one thing, as I was saying, is we handle them very gently. We give them lots of fair warning when we're going to pick them up, when we're going to do something with them. And we do that even when we give them the early neurological stimulation that we've talked about in other videos. And that means when we do a little bit of a stress. So it can be something like this. It can be something like this. Small things like that. And now that they're a little bit older, what we've also started doing as we started putting a couple of barriers in between them and Oshana, getting them to start problem solve and figuring out how to get to her. And what I would like to show you today is part of our handling of them is that we always are in their feet. So we have our fingers in between their toes, their pads. We handle their feet regularly. And of course we clip their nails. So when we clip their nails, we do this about mm, right now about every three or four days so that it's more comfortable for Oshana. And we just use a regular human nail clipper right now because their claws are very small. And we just reach in and we just do a little gentle boop and take the tip off. And that's all we do. I won't do them all so that we don't watch it forever, but you get the idea of how we do it. So everything's really gentle slow easy relax everything's designed to make the puppies the puppies rather calm and accepting of things that are new and different and encourage them to always welcome new experiences so we'll put miss pink back down here to finish her nap and i think i'm going to just pick up mr green for a while here because he's just feeling a little bit out of sorts so we'll just give him a little bit of a hug while we move on to, to other topics so while I'm talking about handling them gently and, and being natural, that's all part of our, our one of our main philosophies and approaches at, at Van Isle Labradoodles. We feed them all a natural diet. Uh, we only clean the whelping box with natural products, mostly vinegar. Uh, no chemicals or, or cleaners are used. Um, we, we give them goat's milk when it's time to start weaning them. Oshana, of course, is eating a full raw diet as well, as you know. And we just try to do everything in the most common, natural way. We let Oshana and the puppies really tell us what's going on and when things need to happen. 
So we don't wean them, we don't introduce them to solid food till they tell us they're ready. And we don't take them out of the maternity ward until they tell us they're ready. So one of the signs is that they're starting to eliminate on their own. So we don't, uh, we don't even begin to think of doing anything until they show us that. So he's, Mr. Green is just hungry. He wants his mom. He's wondering why I don't have anything to offer him. So we'll just put him down here and hope that he settles down now that he's with his litter mates since Oshana's not here at the moment. He'll be fine. And one of the other things in the box here that you see are these rails around the box, um, these white rails that are all the ways around the whelping box. These are called pig rails. And the reason for them is when the puppies are really small that they can't get trapped underneath here and squished by Oshana if she's lying down to, to nurse them. Now, the purpose that they serve is the puppies tend to gravitate and want something over their heads, even though they don't actually know that there's something over their heads because they can't see, but they will instinctively go to where they feel they're safe in a corner. Now, this is one of the reasons why they like their crates. This is the same feeling of security that they get from a crate. So we encourage everybody to crate train their puppies. All of our dogs love their crates and it makes house training a lot easier as well. But you can see already how they naturally tend to have that. And you can see this another Labradoodle pose here upside down with the paws up. That's a great sign that shows you that this puppy is 100% relaxed and very trusting and just quite calm and, and ha enjoying having his tummy rubbed. So now, the other thing I want to talk about today is getting your house ready um, and, and getting your family ready as well. So one of the very first things that you're probably going to want to consider as a family is what are you going to name your puppy? I'm sure you probably already have several ideas running through your heads. Now, as you know, there's only two females in this litter. So chances are you're going to get a boy. Um, we're hoping to be able to retain a female for ourselves so that we can carry on Oshana's beautiful chocolate line. Uh, so if that pans out, then that just leaves one female. So pretty good odds if you're on this reservation list, you're getting a male Labradoodle puppy. Uh, so when you're choosing a name, what should you keep in mind? A couple of things I'd like to suggest to you. First of all, try to pick something that's unique. Um, there's a lot of dogs who have the same name. Uh, Charlie's a, a, a really popular name. Anything that's Finn, Finnick, Finley is a really popular name right now. Molly, Lucy, all those are really popular. Uh, and if you can find one that you like that is perhaps a little more unique, it makes it a little bit easier for you when you're doing recall in a group setting. So if you're at the dog park, uh, or you're at the beach with your Labradoodle puppy and you want to have him come back and you're really like, I want you to come back now, then you want to have a name that your dog is able to recognize clearly as being his name. Now, the other thing is you need to have a name that your dog can recognize clearly. And one of the things to take into consideration is a simple name, one that your kids can say easily, one that your dog can understand easily. So the example I used with the blonde brownies for a name that's probably not a good choice is Geronimo. That's really hard to say even as an adult. It tends to get more blah, blah, blah in your mouth and your dog's not going to be able to ascertain that you're actually calling him. Something that's a little shorter and a little bit more dynamic. Um, one of my favorite two names actually from the blonde brownies litter is Harper and Chico. Those are both great names, not all that common, easy to distinguish from other sounds. They're clear, they're concise. Young children can say them, adults can say it, and older people can say it. And it, it goes in your ear and is easily heard and easily understood by your dog. So those are really good choices. Uh, great names. The other thing that you want to avoid is sounds that your dog does not like. And the one sound that dogs do not like instinctively is anything that sounds like a hiss or an S sound. So uh, a name without too much of a S sound to it is always a good choice. So Cindy would not be the best choice or Sinbad. Those are uh, names that you want to try and stay away from. So it's great, get everybody to sit down, go through a list, start making out 
maybe your top three or four or five. Uh, it's really great if you know what name you're going to use once we do the allocations because then we can start to use the name with your dog uh, while they're here for the last couple of weeks. Now the other thing you want to do is get together as a couple, a family, uh, whatever your situation is and start thinking about how the puppy is going to work in your home. And by this I mean mostly let's consider the practicalities. So where are you going to need a baby gate or an X-Pen? How do you need to block things off? What rooms are you going to want to have as dog-free zones? Now if you've got kids, I would really suggest that perhaps their rooms are a place that might be considered a dog-free zone. Especially if you have children who are playing with Lego or if they're going to be of an age where they're still leaving their toys on the floor. The last thing you want is to have your child's heart broken because their favorite stuffed animal or favorite toy was destroyed by the puppy. We want to always be fostering a good relationship between your child and the puppy. Now if your children are a little bit older, say eight and older, it might be an excellent incentive for having them pick up their own clothes and toys off the floor and keeping their room clean. So I'll leave that up to you and what works for you. Uh, I quilt and one of the things I do is I leave fabric around, I have pins, I have a foot pedal for my sewing machine, I often have my quilts hanging off of the tables while I'm working on them. So when I'm doing that, my quilting room doors are closed because I do not want any puppies running in there and destroying what I have worked on. I would be really annoyed, mostly at myself, because it would be my fault, but I would not be happy if that happened. So go through your house and look for those rooms and then figure out the main room where you want your puppy to be. Where's the room where all of you are going to congregate and be comfortable and have the puppy? Make sure it's comfortable for you to be sitting, make sure it's comfortable for the puppy, and then let's start puppy proofing that room. Now one thing, all of these videos that you'll see when we do them when the, the puppies are really young, I'm sitting in the box with the puppies. And the reason for that is because puppies and dogs really don't enjoy being picked up. We love to pick them up, me particularly. I love picking these babies up and snuggling them and having them right close to me. One of my favorite things to do is the scenting. I just love having those little noses right up in my neck. But dogs really don't enjoy being picked up. It makes them feel a little bit uncomfortable to have their feet off the floor. So if you can have somewhere where you can all sit on the floor, that's great. Your dog will be happier and also you will not be encouraging your puppy to jump on the furniture. And that's another thing to start thinking about. Are you going to be the family that doesn't want your dog on the furniture or are you going to be the type of family that's wherever I am, that's where I want my dog to be? And keep in mind, much better to start off with rules in place and relax them later. You can't change your mind and having ha let the dog up on the Chesterfield and then three weeks later say, yeah, no, this isn't working because it's getting too dirty. So start with restrictions and then relax them. Most of us like to sit on the Chesterfield or in our comfy chair and watch TV in the evenings or read a book and we almost all want to have our dog on our lap with us. So I'm pretty sure all of you are going to end up with your dog on your furniture but you should be starting off right away with not having them on the furniture unless you're positive that you're fine with it. In our house, the dogs go wherever the people do, so they're always permitted to be on the furniture right from day one. Of course, when they're really little, they're not going to be able to jump up on the furniture anyway, so it's kind of a natural thing they're not there. The other thing that you do by uh, being down at their level is you discourage them from jumping up on you. Some people really don't want their dogs to be jumping up on them and really ideally it's best if they don't. Um, and so this is a really good way for your puppy to learn that your puppy's getting attention from you and getting all sorts of play time when they have four on the floor. Height is power to dogs. Um, and the other thing they're doing is they're always trying to get to your face. The, dog, the puppies want to be close to your face because as they get older, they'll lick on the side of their mom's face to stimulate her to regurgitate food for them. And the other thing, reason puppies do that is they'll lick older dogs' lips and around their mouth 
to show them that they're submissive to them and that they're not challenging them. So that is a proper dog behavior. And so that's why dogs are always trying to get to your face and why they want to lick you. They're acknowledging that they're submissive to you and that they love you and, and they are showing you affection when they're kissing you. It's just like how we kiss people. So just keep that in mind. So once you've sort of de determined where you think the place is going to be that you're going to spend time with your puppy, then figure out how you're going to block off the areas where you don't want your puppy to go. Baby gates are great, X pens are great. And I would say, don't buy any of these things yet. Wait till you come for your puppy visit with us. Take a look at our X pens. Look at the size, the height, how they work, what the, how they actually can be configured. Take a look at our baby gate, see how it works, how it might work in your house, the different types of baby gates that you might want to use. It's always good to see these things in action and get a get a feel for them and, and uh, we can show you how we use them and, and how we make use of the products. And then once you've done all of that, the next thing you're going to want to start to consider is what door is your dog going to go in and out of to go to the bathroom? This is a really important thing to establish and you want to have one door and one door only. It's really important that everything you do is consistent. You will have so much success as getting your puppy to learn what you want your puppy to learn if you're consistent. They thrive on the consistency and they'll learn so much more quickly. So pick a door, figure out how it's going to work for you. Um, the other thing you want to keep in mind is you're going to use that door during the night if your puppy wakes up at night when you first come home and you have to take puppy out to go to the bathroom. So somewhere that is accessible fairly readily. Um, but mostly you want to figure out what door works the best for your dog and this will be the door until you're, well probably forever, but at least until your puppy is six months old, that'll be the one and only door you use. And the other uh, spot you want to pick out is where you're going to feed your puppy. So again, you want to have somewhere that's easy for the puppy to access, easy for you to access. You want to have a nice hard surface floor that you can clean up easily. You want to have it where it's a little bit removed from the major traffic flow in the house. So it's you know, a calm, fairly quiet area. You want to have it so that puppy can see you or you're willing to sit there with puppy while puppy is eating. And you want to be able to have ready access to put the food up. Labradoodles are notorious for being poor eaters. They are not driven by food at all. Uh, it sometimes feels like it's going to take them forever to get through their meal. So one of the things we'll talk about when we go through food is we'll offer them their food, we'll leave it for about 10 minutes. If they're walking away, not interested, you want to be able to pick it up and have it somewhere out of the way from kids, other animals, and everything else. So pick a spot that has all of those uh, sort of conveniences available to you. The other thing you want to do is puppy-proof your house. And Labradoodles are no different from having a new baby, a human baby in your house. You want to go around and look for your cords. If you've got lamps with cords, if you have power cords for charging your phone, for a heater, for the TV, what have you, you want to have those all bundled up and put up out of the way so that puppy's not chewing on them. The last thing you want is an electrocuted dog. Uh, that's not a good thing. So you look for that. Um, also go around at the lower level, at your floor level and see, okay, what else is there they can get into? So for us, our end tables in our living room have a top and then they have an open shelf at the bottom. And we tend to put our magazines, uh, hand lotion, books and things like that on that bottom shelf. When we have a new puppy in the house, those get picked up and move somewhere else because the first thing the puppy's going to want to chew on is not the tons of toys you've bought, but of course the magazine or the book from the library or the expensive book that you just bought. Next thing you want to do is go around at what would be about puppy's eye level if he is standing up and look for plants or vases or other decorating items you may have in your home that you can be sure your puppy is probably going to get into and chew on, knock off or whatever. And don't forget when they're playing, 
when they go, they really go. They'll be moving and they have tails and they're a little bit clumsy still. So it's, they'll bang into things. So if you have a small end table uh, or, a, or a small plant stand, you can be sure that'll be the thing that they run into and fall into when they're roaring about chasing a toy. And then whatever is on it will probably fall off. The other thing you want to do, and, and especially discuss with your kids and, and with the adults who are sometimes just as bad, is where you're going to put your cell phones, your tablets, your laptops. Electronic devices are something that they just love to chew on. When I'm in with the puppies, I inevitably have my cell phone in the pocket of my pants. And that is always the first thing they go to, to take out of my pocket, run away with, and chew on. So be warned. I don't know what it is about them, something about the, the smooth surface, I think, but you want to make sure that all your electronics are up fairly high and away from puppies. Oh, and your uh, remote controls as well. Those things are, are really um, magnets for puppies to chew on. And then think about all the toys that you're going to buy. You can go ahead and start buying toys for your puppy. It's more the equipment, the dishes, the X-Pen, the beds and things that I'm suggesting you just wait and till you come for your puppy visit and we have time to discuss that and you can see the different types that we have and, and get some ideas and we'll discuss all of that more in a, a later video but toys you can go ahead and start buying now and where are you going to keep all those toys and one thing you want to do is not have everything out at once for your puppy it's too much stimulation for them so you want to have maybe four to half a dozen toys out of different types, you know, a rope toy, a ball, um, a stuffy, something that squeaks, a, an assortment like that. So um, quite a few people have a, a toy box and they call it the treasure box or the puppy box, but something that has a lid on it that can be chewed so or put up high so that all the toys live in there and you just take a few out and you can rotate them because puppies like to have different things all the time. And then think of a few mats that you might want to have uh, on the floor for the puppy where you might put them. Start to think about where are good resting spots for your puppy. And are you going to have a crate available in your main room where you're going to interact with your puppy? We suggest that you do. It gives your puppy a nice safe place to go, especially if you have uh, children. Uh, and your puppy's like, okay, I, I'm tired now, I need to go somewhere. And sometimes they won't settle down or they won't feel comfortable enough to sleep unless they do have their crate to go into. Uh, you can check out Wayfair. Wayfair has crates that have um, like a coffee table over top of them. So they're quite attractive if you want to have them more as part of your decor in, in whatever room you're going to have your puppy in most of the time. Uh, they're they're not too terribly expensive but um, and they have a variety of styles and I always think that's a, a really great idea and when the puppies are little you can put their treasure chest up on top there so that you have a box on top of the the crate covering where all the toys are kept safe and sound and one thing to look for when you're buying toys is treat balls uh, so you can put little treats inside the balls they're puzzles Labradoodles are really intelligent dogs and, and they love to do challenges like that. So those are most of the things to start looking for in your home. Um, you'll be having your puppy sleeping in your bedroom or one of your children's bedrooms at night. So that'll be sort of uh, not something you have to establish uh, and a crate will go there. But otherwise, th those are the things you want to start looking at in your home. So what I'd really like to have you do now is after you've watched this video and you've had a, a little while to think about it, tell us what name choices you have in mind. I always love to hear everybody's names. They're always so interesting to me what people choose. Um, so if you've got time, put that into the comments, what your, your name choices are. Uh, if you have any questions, of course, ask those in the comments. I'm always happy to answer them. And we hope you like this video and you'll give us a thumbs up. And if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to the channel so that you know right away when our videos come out and you won't miss anything. And next week will be our three week update and we'll do a little bit more on training and how to get ready for house training your puppy. That's always a, a big subject and has quite a lot of information in it. And we'll also give you their normal updates 
their new weights and everybody will have their eyes open by then. So thanks for watching and we'll see you next week for week three, week three's episode of the Cafe Noir Litter.